for joining us to kick off the fall season. This is our first Power Breakfast of the fall, um, and we are really excited to hear from our special guest speaker today, New York City Police Commissioner Edward Caban. I will say, I have never felt so safe. We have the police commissioner here. We have all the top brass here. Uh, we have DA Katz's detail here. Um, <laughs> we have our own security. Uh, we have Kevin and Rich back there who does our Abney events. Usually Don is here keeping us safe. Uh, so no matter what's happening outside, I want everybody to know we are safe in here. So everyone can let their hair down. So before I invite Stephen up to introduce uh, the commissioner, uh, I'd like to just quickly mention what we have coming up here at Abney. So while uh, Commissioner Caban and the NYPD is keeping our city safe so that we can continue business as usual and business better, and we invite tourists back and we get things moving, uh, Abney uh, is doing what we do best. We are bringing people together to convene and discuss the issues that make New York City great. Our panelists here, um, as you see them here, uh, from my left uh, down to the end, we have the Chief of Department, uh, Chief Madry. We have Chief of Dra Training. Um, I, was, I have permission to call her Lola. Chief uh, Obey. We have Chief of Crime Control Strategies, Michael LaPetri. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, that was one of the easier ones. Uh, we have Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives, uh, Chief Barrows. And we have Chief of Staff to the Chief of Department, Assistant Commissioner Kaz Daughtry. So if we could give them a round of applause. I'd like to now introduce our chairman, Stephen Rubenstein, who will introduce today's special guest. Stephen? Thank you, Melva. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start by saying Happy New Year. Shana Tova. It is, um, and it's great to be downtown. I, I was last week, we saw the opening of the Perlman Arts Center. If you think of what, what this area was 22 years ago, and you think, first of all, we're downtown because traffic in Midtown is rough, and we figured you guys would hate on us a little bit if we were at the Hilton. We believe in spreading around, but that said, it is amazing to come downtown and see what's going on. So I want to say thank you all for being here for that. Melvin mentioned this is our first Abney Power Breakfast of the season, and we're starting off strong. Today we're going to talk about one of the most basic covenants we make with government, and that is public safety. Obviously, time of year, you know us Jews like a covenant. <laughs> but at Abney, we know this cannot be a great place to live, work, and raise a family if people are not safe and if they don't feel safe. That was true 50 years ago when Abney was founded. That's true today. Mayor Adams named Edward Caban the new police, com the new police commissioner in July. That was the dead of summer. For a lot of us, summer means taking a break, maybe work a little less, maybe take some time off, get out of the city. That is not true for the NYPD. Summer is the toughest time of the year. It is when crime normally peaks, shootings and homicides in particular. But that was not true this year. Under the leadership of Commissioner Caban and his predecessor, Commissioner Sewell, and this incredible team here on our stage, 2023, was the year crime dropped in the summer. Transit crime is down. Homicides are down. Shootings are down. Overall index crime is down. And that is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Commissioner, just know how grateful we are to you, to the men and the women of the NYPD who spent this summer working the beat and making our city safer. So thank you. Um, before we bring the PC up on stage, I just want to say a few things about him as a way of introduction, things I know that will mean a lot to our community here at Abney. First, we honor his incredible record, 32 years of the NYPD, from his days as a rookie cop, a self-described Puerto Rican kid from Parkchester, walking in the doors of the 4 precinct in the South Bronx. His foot, first job was a foot post, and a 20-something officer, Caban, relished being out of the car, walking the streets, and talking to people face to face. That brand of policing was in his blood. 
He is the son of a detective in the Transit Bureau, who himself was a pioneer fighting for better representation for Hispanic New Yorkers in the department. Before joining the force, his dad had given him a tip, your words are your greatest tool. Eddie made this his mantra, building relationships one person at a time in every single community he worked in. So you can imagine how it felt for him to feel on the stand, on the steps, the city hall with the mayor, with his dad retired on one side and his mom, who he called the general of his family on the other, to be sworn in as the first Hispanic commissioner of the NYPD. Now, while that was his moment, it was also a moment for thousands of men and women serving in the department and for millions of New Yorkers who look at Commissioner Caban's appointment as not just, one, they see it as his success, but it's also their success. Um, and that is a huge deal to us in a town that respects diversity and loves how different we all are, but yet manage to come together to work together and help each other. Now, you might think the police commissioner, that this is his, uh, his dream job, but he says that's not actually true. The best job he ever had was being assigned to Yankee Stadium as a young lieutenant. <laughs> For a Bronx kid, he got paid to watch Derek Jeter and Mario Mariano Rivera win the championship, and for him, that was as good as it gets. <laughs> By the way, you do not have to be from the Bronx for that to be about as good a job as you can get. <laughs> Commissioner, please know we're going to do everything we can to be helpful to you. We, we too, see your success as our success. Everybody, please give a warm Abney welcome to Police Commissioner Edward Cabana. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here with each and every one of you. I want to begin by thanking Steve for that warm introduction. I also want to acknowledge his team, the folks here at ABME, Rubenstein, for bringing us all together. In fact, bringing people together is the essence of ABME. In many ways, and on so many issues, ABME is the glue that bonds. We have real estate, finance, government, retail, and the not-for-profit spaces all here. Adley activates people, rallies them around like-minded uh, people. And quite frankly, long before our mayor adopted the phrase, the people in this room have shown everyone what it means to get stuff done. We saw this when there was a call to action to help the city address stolen vehicles and Abney purchased a large quantity of air tags to hand out to motorists. We are grateful for that and so much more. When you look at the NYPD in September of 2023, we have come a long way from this administration first took over. And in some very recent news, I heard they sworn a new commissioner, some guy from the Bronx. Very nice guy, I'm told. But in all seriousness, when I took over as PC, the mayor had very clear expectations. We had to keep pushing violence down. My predecessor, Keyshawn Sewell, had begun to turn the tide on persistent violence. But my tenure was beginning just as the summer was heating up. And as most New Yorkers know, the summer months are not typically a time when crime goes down. In fact, it's usually quite the opposite. But thanks to relentless data-driven deployments and a host of other crime-fighting strategies, the summer of 2023 saw reductions in murder and shootings and virtually every other crime category. Let's look at the month of August, for instance. <clears throat> Let's look at the month of August, for instance. Overall, crime fell, notably both the number of shooting incidents and the number of people struck by gunfire were driven below pre-pandemic levels of 2019. In fact, there were fewer people shot in August of this year than any year on record, with the single exception of 2018, which is the benchmark for the modern era. This is progress. This is momentum. But let's be very clear, there is still so much that needs to be done. 
Since taking over the top job, these last two months have been a whirlwind. In one sense, I have 32 years with the New York City Police Department. I've experienced many things. Spent a decade working in the Bronx, a decade in Manhattan, and a decade working hand in hand with the amazing communities of Northern Brooklyn. And then, in the other sense, no matter how much experience you have, there's nothing quite like being the PC. From day one, myself and my team have been going nonstop, taking a fresh look at the agency from top to bottom, exploring the various bureaus and units, identifying areas that could use some improvement, and also seeking out talent to fill some vacancies. All the while, keeping our foot firmly on the gas when it comes to driving down violence. As it always does, the summer culminated with the Labor Day festivities in Brooklyn. Historically, that weekend has sometimes presented challenges in terms of violence and disorder. Last year, the beautiful celebration of the Caribbean culture was not disrupted or marred by violence. The NYPD played a central role in that success. Therefore, expectations were high this year for a repeat. And so, as the last float exited the parade route Monday afternoon, the NYPD took stock of the weekend. When all was said and done, we exceeded last year's accomplishments. Zero acts of violence during the Juve celebration and lower overall crime across the entire weekend. And we managed to do that while also protecting the US Open, the Electric Zoo, the anniversary of 9-11, and several other local parades and events. This type of success does not happen by chance. Your NYPD cops were hard at work in Brooklyn that weekend when they removed 70 illegal guns from our city streets, bringing the total number of illegal guns removed this year into New York City by nearly 5,000 guns. We have often heard our mayor talk about public safety being the key to prosperity, and I couldn't agree more. In fact, we are seeing a showcase of these two concepts come together in our city right now. The 78th United Nations General Assembly is in full swing today. The president has been in town since Monday. We also have many other presidents and leaders. Over 170 heads of states in all visiting New York City right now and they have their families with them, staying in our hotels, shopping, dining out. It is the largest gathering of world leaders anywhere on the globe and is a tremendous boon to the economy. And together with our partners, the Secret Service, the State Department, the FBI and more, it is happening on our watch. I've been getting up to the minute briefings. The coordination is seamless. The plans, flawless. This includes allocating resources for protests, both planned and unplanned. We saw this in Lower Manhattan and around the UN with climate protests and a face-off between opposing parties from one visiting nation. There are parts of the world experiencing turmoil and war. It is our job to ensure New York City does not become a stage for those conflicts. To that end, I'm proud to say New York's finest is doing a terrific job. Of course, with all these dignitaries and security protecting them, one thing we cannot control or avoid, Steve, is the traffic. <laughs> there will be gridlock, and as always, the best bet will be to use public transportation. Fortunately, our transit system is also marked by improvement in safety this year. Investments were made last year. We searched thousands of offices into the transit systems. Our offices knew what our expectations were, and the results speak for themselves. Overall crime is now at pre-pandemic levels. This year we are down roughly 5% in overall crime, with robbery seeing double-digit reductions in 2023. Contacts around fare evasion have more than doubled and there have been upwards of 125,000 civil or criminal summons issued in the system 
so far in 2023. Our playing clothes and pickpocket teams are out there arresting those who work the transit system. Our arrests are up by more than 50%. And as far as addressing the persistent issues of mental illness and homelessness, our message has been clear. It is not a crime to be homeless. And we also understand that we cannot arrest our way out of mental health issues facing our city. That is why we have partnered with the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, as well as the Department of Homeless Services and the MTA to conduct vital outreach, where services can be provided, they are being offered. And these types of contacts have increased significantly over the last year. But let me for a moment acknowledge something that many folks might be thinking. As I stand up here and recite crime category after crime category being down this year, I realize that the data might not match a person's individual experience. Yes, there have been victims of crimes. People have been harassed or threatened and have never reported their experience to the police. Many sensational acts of violence have also been shared widely in our news. They leave a lasting impression. All these things inform how you think. This is the intersection of perception versus reality. I say this once again to affirm we are not even close to being done. But I also think it's useful to acknowledge the reality that crime can go up or crime can go down. And given the two, I take a measure of comfort in seeing things move in the right direction. One crime category that has given us a challenge is that of stolen cars, or GLA as we call it in the NYPD. Perhaps another product of the COVID era. But the rise in GLA has also been driven by the TikTok challenge surrounding the thefts of Kias and Hondas. Regardless of its origin, the impact of crime is felt the most by everyday New Yorkers. Their car is an extension of their home, and to have it stolen leaves a lasting impact. This is why the NYPD recently launched a comprehensive plan to address this crime using advanced technology such as license plate readers, along with our aviation unit and some other GPS tracking tools, we are simply not just tracking stolen cars. We have a multi-layered approach to this effort, and the results are very encouraging. Arrests around stolen vehicles are up about 50% this year, and nearly 150% over the last month. And we will keep the pressure on when it comes to this crime working with our partners in the district attorney's office to build the strongest possible cases. Now shifting now to some quality of life related issues, the proliferation of illegal scooters and ATV have long been on our radar. Operators of these vehicles are often unlicensed and uninsured. They drive recklessly, putting everyone around them in danger. We have made a concerted effort to address this condition. So far this year, we have taken more than 13,000 of these vehicles off our streets. This is an added value to the type of enforcement. All too often, we see overlap between those who ride around on stolen scooters or in stolen cars with those willing to carry a gun and possibly pull the trigger. And perhaps one of the most troubling realities about these crimes is that our kids are involved more than ever. Our arrest of people under the age of 18 for stolen vehicles or weapon possession is up nearly 35% this year. The impact of this trend cannot be overstated. And while the NYPD is doing everything it can to reach our kids before the cuffs ever go on, the need for positive engagement with and comprehensive programs for our youth must remain a top priority for all. Another issue we are all facing is the migrant crisis. And as we understand, this complex issue extends beyond the scope of the NYPD in terms of long-term solutions. What I can tell you, however, is the NYPD will always uphold its duty to protect New Yorkers and enforce the law. 
So whether you arrived in the city three hours ago or you are a third generation immigrant from Italy, the laws are the same for everyone. And to that end, I can tell you the NYPD is responding to locations where migrants are living and congregating and enforcing the laws as needed. Arrests in and around migrant shelters are up significantly, and we will continue to hold people accountable when they break the law, just as we do in every community around the five boroughs. Now, any success that NYPD experiences is always shared. And of course, the failures belong to me. But I am not surprised to see things moving in the right direction, to see momentum in our favor. I am blessed to have a strong team, some of whom join me here today and look forward to answering some questions. This team is a snapshot of our department, talented, diverse, from near and far. When I was sworn in, I commented that when I was a rookie cop, I recall looking up at the wall, executive photos, and not seeing anyone who looked like me. Today, our young officers are more diverse than ever. And when they look up at the wall of photos and their command, I hope they see someone they can relate to. I hope they see my photo or my chief of department's photo and ask themselves the question, what if? Because to that question, I say yes. Yes, a working class kid from the Bronx can go from being a big cop to the top cop. <laughs> yes, a Puerto Rican can be the police commissioner. <laughs> I hope they look at the, up at the wall in the police academy and see Lola Obey's photo, our chief of training, and understand that a Nigerian immigrant can become an attorney, rise in the ranks, and go on to run the largest law enforcement training operation in America. <laughs> the answer to every question about the future is yes. New York City is a global city. It does so much for so many. The people of Amni, the people in this room all play a huge part and that important work. And the one thing I will leave you with, the truest thing I can tell you is that the women and men in blue who reflect this global metropolis we call home are your partners every step of the way. They are committed to the work, to our city. They too want a better New York for all. Thank you very much for having me and for listening to me this morning. I wish everyone a safe, and sweet New Year's. All right, thank you, Commissioner. We have a lot of questions, as we do in this crowd. Um, I, I guess I'd start by, by talking, you talked about crime over the summer and strategies in reducing crime, and you talked about increased arrests amongst youth, um, and, and sort of a, it seems to be there's a trend in younger members of our of our community committing crimes. So can I, I assume outreach, you talk, out, outreach is obviously everybody's responsibility, but it seems like a unique time for the PD to do outreach because of the increased diversity in the department and kind of the way the PD really reflects more of our city. So can you talk a bit more about how you're interacting with kids, what are the strategies, maybe some of the things you learned as a B cop that you're now using as the PC. In your team. You know, Steve, in your dialogue you talked about my father, and I was blessed to grow up in a police household, and you talked about some of the things that he taught me as a transit officer in those subway cars, the importance of speaking to people, how he learned that this was so important in his career, and that's exactly what he told me when I became a police officer. Your mouth will be the best thing that you could ever have, not just on your tool belt. And throughout my career, you know, I've, I've said I've worked in many different boroughs, from the Bronx to Manhattan to Brooklyn and talking with people, the one thing I took out of it was, and they'll always say, no matter what community you go to, they're not looking for a brilliant mind that speaks. They're looking for a compassionate heart that listens. 
someone who's gonna help them with their problems. <laughs> Understand their concerns and are willing to help them. And there came a point in my career where I had the good fortune of working in Brooklyn with someone who I consider a mentor, someone who I thought was the best person I've ever seen interact with our communities, different events from slave rides to now community Comstat, and that is our chief, Jeff Mantry. I'm sure he could talk about some of his initiatives. Good morning, everyone. Um, listen, my boss, he, he, he said it best, just really having our cops going out there and listening to people, young people, adults, everyone and just understanding what they need and then we have to figure out how to deliver that. And we can't always deliver, but this is when we need our partners here in this room and throughout the communities to help us deliver. But when you talk about some real, you know, when we talk about real programs, things that we're doing, strategies, especially involving the youth, early this year we increased our youth coordination officers in the commands. Most commands had two youth coordination officers, officers specifically tasked with working with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. We pushed that up from in every command from two, some cases six, some cases eight, depending on how big the command is, with a supervisor. And again, their job is to really go out there, engage our youth. And the message I gave to our youth coordination officers is, don't go to the children who come to the precinct or go to the programs. Go to the young people who we're losing or on the verge of losing. Those are the ones we really have to go after. And the youth officers have that mandate. We also increased our school safety deployment. Um, we didn't have a dedicated team to go from school to school and work with the schools when they're having problems. We put a, uh, a unit with 50 officers dedicated to go to different schools as we see the need. So they're able to go all around the city when we see different uh, issues in schools. When you talk about programs, when you talk about programs, um, the NYPD engages in so many programs and a lot of people don't know about our programs. So we try to advertise them and put them out there and we have to work on that. I think we could do a better job at that. But we do things from helping young people with uh, financial literacy, uh, life skills, all kinds of life skills, programs that help develop that, um, interview skills, resume writing, tutoring programs. Over the summer, and I didn't even know this, but over the summer, two things. We have a haunted house out in Fort Totten that we run all year round. So for the summer, we were bringing all the summer camps out there to, as something for them to do during the course of the summer. But then as I was out there, one of my youth coordination comes up to, officers comes up to me and says, Chief, I want you to meet my group. This is my ESLA group. It was a, a, a group of young people, asylum seekers, young people who couldn't speak English, a whole camp full that an officer in Bushwick and his team created on their own, not being prompted by the department. And I was so amazed I had an opportunity to just you know, mess with them and, and take pictures with them. I, uh, I couldn't really speak with them. I couldn't, I couldn't speak the language. But they, uh, I was able to communicate with them. You know, we can always communicate in other ways. And we had laughs. We pointed at the haunted house and just uh, understood each other and had an opportunity to take pictures with them. But this is some of the creativity that goes on in the department that we're not even aware of sometimes. We have officers who are out there dedicated to their communities and they're working with young people and they're creating small programs on their own, reading programs, leadership programs, after school tutoring. We have it all in this department and it doesn't get advertised as, as, as well as it should be and we have to work on that. But there, if you go to any of your local precincts and ask what they're doing with the youth, you'd be surprised at some of the things that they're doing personally besides the things that we mandate from them. And if anybody saw over the weekend, we had our Times Square takeover where I did my annual three-on-three -three basketball tournament. We did it right in front of the Red Steps, five basketball courts, up on the big screen. They had me up there missing jump shots. <laughs> I tell them, I said, who's, who's filming this stuff? Don't embarrass me. I can't play basketball like that. But uh, we do a lot with our young people. We're going to continue to do a lot with our young people. It's so much more than traditional 
good guys and bad guys, cops and robbers. We have to step out those traditional lines, work with our young people so they don't ever get involved with the criminal justice system. And we'll, we'll keep on doing that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, I, I know how hard the job is that you guys do just to protect us and that it is not lost on us, the effort you guys make in outreach and all the things you talk about, which are hard and probably like especially hard given like the core of what you're responsible for. And I just want to say thank you because it sounds like it's a lot and, and it sounds like it also makes a big, a big difference. So thank you. Um, I want to ask about data. Obviously, we, we talked a lot of a lot of stats, and um, uh, and and since uh, Chief of Crime Control Strategies Michael uh, Lepetri is here, um, can you can you talk a bit about like where you're focused on data at the moment, and a bit more granularly about how you guys and, and not commission not to not to push this away from you, like how you're using data now as a mechanism to keep the city the city safe. Before Mike answers, and I apologize, Mike, I just want to jump in, you know, because we look at. Where we were when we started the administration, we were up over 40% in crime to where we are now, down in crime for the first time in three years. And I want to give a lot of kudos to Michael Petri, who we like to call our quarterback, who's relentlessly looking at our numbers, our figures, and he'll take you through them. And thank you, Mike. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, just to start with, with, with some of the, you know, the crime data, and you know, we, as we all know, when we talk about crime data, we're talking about victims. Right, so I just want to expand for a couple of minutes on, on, on what we saw this summer and compare it to the past three years. You know, first and foremost, uh, Chief Madry had, had cornered me uh, in my office uh, in April and said, you know, Mike, uh, we, we got to do something different, you know, and, and obviously under the leadership of, of Commissioner Sewell at the time and Commissioner Caban as being the first deputy, uh, commissioner, uh, we, we really did need to do something different, and we did. And what we did was we, we identified areas in the city that have historic high crime uh, in the summer months. So how do we, you know, what do we look at? Well, we look at street crime, right? So when we look at not just violent street crime, but we were looking at shoplifting. We were looking at street robberies. We were looking at the lawlessness that, unfortunately, a lot of us have seen over the past few years. So we overlaid the data and what we did was we saturated those areas with foot patrols. 70 areas in New York City, 31 precincts, four PSAs at the highest crime street crime times that we saw and those were between 5.30 and two o'clock in the morning, seven days a week. When it, uh, then the time increases to about five o'clock in the morning on Friday and Saturday. So the officers stayed out there until five o'clock in the morning on Friday and Saturday. And what we saw between the months of May and, and, and the middle of September was 600 less shooting victims than 2020, 400 less shooting victims than 2021, and four, I'm sorry, 215 less shooting victims from 2022. So that, that, that's a lot of victims of, of violence. And when you drill down on the data even, even further and you use those hours and you capture, you know, the reduction, it even goes further as far as the overall reduction. The city saw a 26% uh, decrease in shooting incidents in the summer months overall. When you drill down to those 70 zones that we established, it increases to 32%. And it also increases to a thousand less index crime victims. So the the officers were were in the right areas. It was a huge undertaking uh, by many 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 people. But ultimately, the men and women who were out there late at night on foot patrols in some of the toughest areas of New York City did the job, and they did it outstanding. We will continue continue to be relentless and decrease the victims of crime in New York City. So we talk about analytical tools. So, so, so this is where the really smart people in my office do the work. I tell them what I want, and they spit it out. So I think it is interesting. You know, a lot of times people are like, so what does the NYPD t t do to analyze uh, their data? Well, well, think about billions of records, right? Think about that. Billions of records being analyzed by the NYPD. So it starts, you know, we use Python. 
uh, Python is like the back end to where we are able to identify, I mean, uh, you know, analyze those billions of records. We use COBOL to do link analysis. August Pro and Web to create advanced map and geospatial analysis. The Domino environment where we use Python and R. DB Visualizer to create structured query language to get data directly from databases and connect them. Cellbright to do phone analysis. We also use Cognos, obviously, for our reports and for our data. ESRI dashboards for our NIBIN, to, to, which comes back faster than ever, which really enhances our Detective Bureau's capability to link a firearm to many different areas. And we know in those areas, using data, what gangs of crew members live in those areas, what gangs of crew members have been arrested in those areas, what gangs or crews frequent those housing developments or those specific blocks. What motivates that gang? Is it social media driven? Is it driven by uh, making money off of credit card fraud? Are they making money off of doing organized shoplifting? Are they making money uh, drug dealing? And that's how we target these crews. It's all done with a precision model. We don't, we don't cast that, white, that wide uh, net anymore and say, okay, well, this area has, has, a lot of, uh, has a lot of street violence. Okay, we know that, but what's causing the street violence? Like I said, they could be fighting over a lot of different things. So those are some of the tools. But there's just a couple more minutes of, of uh, what I want to talk about, and that's retail theft. Because I see a lot of people here that I've met with met for many times over many years. And the retail theft that, that continues to plague New York City. But I will say we're moving in the right direction, and we have a lot of work to do. Re retail theft is down approximately 8% this year compared to last year. What I like is that retail theft arrests are up 19%. So an 8% decrease in retail theft, but an 18% increase in retail theft arrests. But it's not just when it does not start with placing handcuffs on somebody. As I always say, that's just the beginning of the journey of, of who we're putting handcuffs on. And that's the important thing, right? We're not talking about people that have been arrested once or twice committing low-level retail theft. That, 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 those individuals do not come from a conversation from me or to a DA's office. And, you know, sitting in front of me is DA Katz from, from uh, obviously, from Queens. And, you know, I will touch on some of the initiatives that, that we've done. Look, it, it's, it's, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between the retail uh, businesses, the NYPD, the community, and also, obviously, the prosecutors. And I will say this. I've been doing this for a long time. The partnership between the DA's offices and the NYPD has never been better. The partnership between the DA's offices and the NYPD when it comes to retail theft has changed immensely over the past couple of years. Right? We talk about recidivism-driven crime. We identify 425 people this year that have been arrested over 5,000 times for retail theft. 425 people. So we have 18,000 retail theft arrests. 30, uh, those, those 425 have been arrested 5,000 times. When, when, when I really started drilling down, you know, years ago with the retail theft, uh, you know, issue, um, not many of those individuals were incarcerated. I would say approximately 15%. That has almost doubled now. 31% of those 436, 436 people are incarcerated today. And quite frankly, they should be incarcerated. They should be incarcerated because they've all been arrested well, you know, they all have over seven arrests for retail theft. But again, if, if, if the DA's office isn't, isn't sharing data with us and we're not sharing data with the DA's office and we're not using initiatives like serving people with trespass notices and then arresting that person for then a burglary if they commit a crime, not just for, for entering the location. But again, what are we getting at, at that time? We're getting an arraignment for burglary. And that's what we ask. We ask, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we have to do it right. And again, that's credit to the DA's office uh, across the city. And again, thank you, DA Katz, for the partnership with Retail Theft. And thank you, everyone, and, and great being here. Thank you. Commissioner, we talk a lot about uh, the crime in the here and now. Can you also talk a little bit about like what some long-term initiatives are for the PD and a little bit have they changed? Uh, since, since, since you took over? You know, a lot, a lot of our focus now is on technology and how we use technology. And technology plays a lot of part, a 
a big part in all of our initiatives. I have Assistant Commissioner Kaz Daughtry here, who kind of spearheads a lot of the initiatives, and he could talk about the technology we use. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. Technology has been a, a key role in both our Honorable Mayor Adams and Police Commissioner Caban. Ever since the pandemic, there has been a real uptick in stolen cars, GLAs as we like to refer to them as. The use of paper plates, temporary plates, are also associated with these stolen cars, commonly referred to sometimes as ghost vehicles. Additionally, these stolen cars are often connected to more violent crimes that we're starting to see. Shootings, robberies, burglaries. So the NYPD needed to act. When you try to address stolen vehicles, the, log the logistics can be a little bit of a challenge, especially in such a dense environment like New York City. So we incorporated, as the commissioner just says, some of our existing technology to help us apprehend these offenders. The first piece of existing technology I want to talk about is our license plate readers. They are always scanning for stolen plates. Once we lock into a stolen plate, we can follow the vehicle without actually in close vehicle pursuit. As Chief Majory refers to sometimes, he doesn't want to see 10 police cars behind one stolen vehicle. This is not the Dukes of Hazzard in New York City. <laughs> the information surrounding these license plates can easily be accessible through our domain awareness system. And this system can be pulled up remotely in the field by any officer using their department smartphone. We utilize also our aviation unit. It can zero in on a stolen car as it's being followed or tracked. Our units can fall back the aviation assets, our air support, can continue to actively follow this vehicle throughout New York City. There's even, there's even an option for our top executive team here to watch this vehicle pursuit or us following this vehicle through our smartphone again with a live feed where any one of the, the individuals on this dais can terminate the pursuit if they feel that New Yorkers are at risk. We also have a remote GPS device that we just purchased through the department. It's called Star Chase. This allows us to deploy a projectile at the stolen vehicle the projectile sticks to the vehicle, and it allows the ability for us to track the stolen vehicle in real time through our Joint Operations Center and also on the officer's smartphone. Let me give you an example. An officer runs a license plate, comes back stolen. The officer, the officer can shoot this projectile, this GPS device tracker at the back of the vehicle, whether it be from a handheld device or a device that's mounted on our police car, and we can track this vehicle through real time through our Joint Operations Center and also on the officer's smartphone. Many of these tools are designed to lower the risks associated with apprehending persons who may try to evade authorities in stolen vehicles. I say this, the days of doing what you want to do in New York City under this executive leadership team and our mayor are over. <laughs> of course, we always have to strike the balance between public safety and the risk of anybody in the public getting hurt while apprehending these individuals, these bad actors who commit bad behavior and put the public in danger. Let's talk about drones. Drone technology is not something new that the department's been using. We currently have drones and we're utilizing them more. And we use them in a different variety of applications in the city with regards to stolen vehicles and license plates. Drones are useful for keeping an eye on public areas known as car meetups. A lot of the car meetups that we see in New York City 
they bring stolen cars to. Where many riders of these stolen vehicles con uh, converge, including illegal dirt bikes, illegal scooters, and illegal ATVs. These vehicles often t uh, take off together in mass meetups, also known as rideouts. We can also keep a watchful eye, travel patterns, without being up close to the, uh, uh, for them to follow our movement. This allows the NYPD to be thoughtful about how we approach and apprehend drivers also of illegal vehicles. Technology continues to be an important part of our Commissioner Caban, Mayor Adams, strategic initiative and incorporating new technology it becomes, when it becomes available to New York City. When it becomes available, we will try it, we will use it to help continue to keep crime down in New York City. Thank you. And I also have my, 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 my uh, Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives here who we'll go over one or two initiatives that we're looking at. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. So, I mean, when you look at the NYPD as an organization, I mean, we really have a tremendous legacy when it comes to innovation. And that's really always at the forefront of this agency. When you think about its history, the creation of the Night Watch since its inception, you think about um, the NYPD being the first police department to have a bomb squad, to have an aviation unit, the first department to use fingerprinting techniques and mugshots, and you go through the decades to the innovation that CompStat was and what a game changer that was for policing in New York City and really globally to the creation of our body-worn camera program, which there is not a program that can match its size and its scope, and to all of the data that we publicly disclose, you know, from enforcement data to operations data to training info, and then just finding new ways to directly connect with the people that we serve. It's a tremendous legacy. Uh, all of us on this executive staff are really stewards of that history. And I think the direction, I know the direction from Commissioner Caban, but I think the direction from any police commissioner is that that continues. That we continue to push this police department and quite frankly the policing profession uh, to the, for the better. Uh, one of the, you know, specifically some of the initiatives that we're doing in the department, we announced our strategic plan earlier this year under Commissioner Sewell and it's something that's continuing under Commissioner Caban. And it really has four goals. It's a two-year plan. Um, it's to strengthen our workforce, uh, promote wellness, give our, give our officers the best training and the best tools to do their jobs, uh, to transform policing through technology and innovation, to connect with our community partners in new ways, and to uh, promote public safety and respect in everything that we do. And, and with this plan, we have you know, pushed every one of our bureaus at the NYPD to buy into this, to really take a look at every program, every initiative, every plan that you do over the next two years and kind of shape it into the, shape it in, in, in mirror our strategic plan and how every one of those plans, initiatives, and programs that they do reverts back to one of those goals. Because if we meet those goals, those four goals I talked about, the NYPD is really going to continue to elevate itself and further solidify that it is the leader when it comes to law enforcement. It is the leader when it comes to policing. It's gonna be the leader when it comes to providing services. It's gonna be the leader when it comes to community connectedness. And so there's a tremendous amount of progress I think that we're seeing under this plan. A couple of things I'll just talk about initially. So one of the things that, that, that we started in 2022 was we did a top to bottom review staffing analysis of the department. We wanted to strengthen our workforce by strengthening the patrol force. And we looked at positions where some of our officers were assigned who could be doing administrative duties that could be filled by a civilian. So we have pushed hundreds of officers back out onto the patrol force and have been able to backfill them with civilians. And that's a lesson that we took from you know, many of the industries in this room. I know when you're running your businesses, running your nonprofits, even looking at your agencies, you're always looking at how do you become more efficient, right? How do we, how do we deploy resources correctly in good times, tough times? And it's been, it's, it's been important work that we've done. Um, 
we're also strengthening our workforce through the modern tour chart that, that we've been piloting in our Bronx commands and some of our uh, transit commands. The Police Benevolent, Benevolent Association, which is the union that represents most of our uniform officers, signed a new collective bargaining agreement with the city. And in that, in that agreement, it uh, directs that the department pilot um, what's called a modern tour, where officers can be working 10-hour and 12-hour daily tours. So they're working more hours during the day, but they're getting more days off. So some of our officers, instead of working five days in a row with rotating days off, they're working three days where they're working four days. And that's more time for our officers to spend with their families. It's more time for our officers to pursue professional development opportunities. And quite frankly, it's more time for our officers to you know, take that mental break that they need, which is important. And we're finding new ways to connect with our communities through community comp stat, which has been referenced. Where we are bringing the community into our comp stat process to identify local issues and talk about, uh, talk about solutions. There's two other initiatives I'll just hit really quickly. We're always looking at how we can um, access, provide accessibility to the public. We want to be the most accessible police department in the world. Um, and that started with efforts like our online crime reporting system where you can report certain crimes to the police department online and get the same level of service that you would in a precinct to all of the data that we publicly post, my office, we publish 45 different reports on a monthly and quarterly basis uh, regarding data related to the police department. Like I said, it can be enforcement data, operations data, training info. We release tens and thousands of data sets on the, uh, the city's open data portal. And earlier this year, we started uh, an initiative where we are sending uh, alerts to elected officials. Um, public safety alerts to give them the clearest picture of crime that's going on in the city because our elected officials, they're passing laws that impact public safety, impact the operation of the department, and it's very important that they get the clearest picture po possible of crime in the city. Yes, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for confirming that. Um, Thank you, Gil. And we're moving towards, and I think I say all this because we're moving towards really developing an app for the public to be able to download on their phone an NYPD app where you can get a lot of the info that I just talked about at your fingertips. And then the last thing I'll just talk about is related to professional development. So um, it's called our United Cities program, which is something I'm actually really excited about. Um, and it's a program that's existed since 2020. We signed an MOU in 2020 with the London Metropolitan Police, which is one of the few police departments that is really a peer to the NYPD when you talk about size and scope. And it, what we did with this MOU is set up kind of an exchange program where we're exchanging information, we're, we're, we're developing best practices, and we have this ambassadorship type program where officers from the NYPD are paired with their peers in the London Met. You know, they, they meet virtually once a week. It's a 12-week program. They meet virtually once a week, and they talk about a local public safety issue and how they can come, uh, how they can develop solutions to resolve it. And that works towards basically a presentation that they give to department executives at the end. It's a tremendous professional development opportunity for our officers, but it's also something that I think further um, highlights the point that the NYPD is and should be really an international thought leader. You know, to really be a, an international presence when it comes to policing. We're more than just a municipal police department and initiatives like that I think really hammer that home. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to close with one question. We'll talk a little bit about training. I know you guys do a lot, especially kind of on cultural competency, and I know it is a massive force to train well. So Commissioner and uh, Chief uh, Obey, can you talk a bit about how you do this? And then also, if we can be helpful, because we all train or have been trained for different skills in our own, in our own companies and our not-for-profits and, and labor here. And so if we can be helpful and have suggestions, we'd welcome that as well. Thank you so much. Morning, everyone. Um, so on the training uh, and um, you know, we can always certainly tap into you to help with uh, recruitment. One of the things that we do well uh, with our recruitment, you look at five years, the last five years, that's uh, January 2018 hires to January 2023 hires. Uh, we've kind of focused also on um, really just um, um, female recruits. So 23% of our current class uh, right now are uh, female. So um, that translates to one in four new hires is, uh, is a female, right? So this satisfies our 20, uh, 30 by 30 pledge, 
where we, um, um, where women will make up about 30% of the young YPD by 2030. So that's a good sign. Overall, women uh, account for about 21% of the NYPD. Um, Chief Madri touched on um, one of the um, uh, youth programs. This is um, a program that's actually targeted um, at college students. It's called the Police Cadet Corps. Just on a personal note, I was a cadet myself, and that's how I got into the NYPD. So it's uh, somewhat of a pipeline into the NYPD from college. Um, we, uh, the NYPD essentially pays for tuition, and upon graduation, the cadets transition into becoming police officers. The cadets currently account for 10 to 12 percent of our entry class, so that's a big uh, percentage of um, our entry, uh, um, our recruit classes. When you think, on average, we hire about 525 recruits um, uh, every quarter, every uh, January, April. I hope I get my uh, my months right. October and then, yeah. So three, four times a year, we have uh, recruit classes, and uh, we have uh, 10 to 12 of our entry classes are actually cadets. So that's a big portion of the the, um, the recruits that we get in. We also tap into community uh, policing strategies, and. Um, um, a focus on youth programs. I know Mad Chief Madrid touched on that community engagement, mentorship programs, and also just uh, promotion of a uh, diverse leadership. Like uh, Chief, I mean, like Commissioner um, Caban mentioned, um, by looking at that wall and looking at, you know, hoping to see people that actually look like him, through uh, promotion of diverse leadership, we hope that um, our diverse ranks can actually serve as a model for future officers and instill confidence in the community. Just um, in terms of um, I think one of the questions we actually uh, received was uh, about uh, the curriculum itself, just concerns about public safety. Uh, about public safety. We focus on uh, comprehensive uh, training programs that, um, for example, scenario-based training, where these officers actually simulate real-life situations that they might encounter on the job. We also have CIT training, that's the crisis intervention training, and this train, uh, the officers are trained to handle situations where individuals are experiencing uh, issues with mental uh, health, uh, mental health issues, and also emphasizing safety and de-escalation during the situations. We also focus on uh, cultural sensitivity and diversity training in a city like ours, where um, this helps the officers interact respectfully with uh, diverse community and address bias-related concerns. We also train um, on uh, critical incidents response, where the officers are actually handling critical incidents, such as terrorist uh, threats or large-scale incidents, to protect public safety effectively. And last but not least, conflict, uh, conflict resolution and uh, de-escalation. And this helps to resolve conflicts and minimize the use of uh, force when necessary. So, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you. Final parting word. I just want to thank everyone who took the time out to come here. And I would like to say that public safety is a shared responsibility, that we do nothing alone. So thank you for everyone helping the New York City Police Department achieve their goals. And I know a lot of them are not here, but I want to thank our New York City police officers who are out there day in and day out to help keep our city safe. Thank you and God bless. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.